Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is the first of five talks about non-duality. We'll get to a definition of the term in a moment, but to begin, we can say that this video series aims to help us feel more connected with our bodies, one another, and the earth. We live in a stressful civilization, so we feel a lot of tension and other discomforts in our bodies. Many of us do. At the same time, we live in our heads, thinking and planning and remembering. That combination of tension and discomfort and a lot of cognitive activity can make the mental part of our experience feel very separate from the bodily part. But we can use mindful biology to bring more wholeness to bear on the experience. Because of all the problems that the civilization faces, ecological, geopolitical, economic, and so on, many of us live on edge with fear and anxiety about the future. This results in conflict, so that there is a sense of division and separation very often between self and other. This too can be softened and eased with mindful biology. Finally, we live in technologically rich environments that are at the same time rather impoverished in terms of connection with the natural world. Climate controlled buildings, electronic screens and technologies, the various forms of transportation that we use, all of them tend to keep us feeling rather distant from nature. In the ideal, we will find ways to get out and be around a little greenery, whether at a park or a garden or whatever. But we can also find ways to connect with the earth in our own biology. So we'll be looking at all of these ways of softening the various forms of division that we experience. Let's begin. So non-duality is a term that's heard more and more often in spiritual circles these days. Probably you have uh, some idea of what it means. I'll begin with a definition I cobbled together from a couple of online sources. Non-duality highlights the essential wholeness of life. So the idea of wholeness is to soften our sense of division and separation. The idea of highlights, I think, refers to the fact that we're not creating a sense of wholeness, we're illuminating the wholeness that already exists. And that brings us to the word essential. The essential truth of life is that there is wholeness. There is, of course, a lot of separation. Our cells are separate from one another. They're separate from other cells because of membranes. We have separate bodies from one another. So there is separation. But the essential truth is one of wholeness. And non-duality is a form of spiritual practice that you can find in many different traditions that helps us remember and rediscover the essential wholeness that is always present in life. Now, the word non-duality implies that there are some dualities that cause difficulty. One that gets a lot of attention is the supposed duality between what we call mind and what we call body. Another is the duality between the individual self and other people. And a third is the duality between the individual self and nature or the earth. These are the three dualities that we'll focus on. There are, of course, others that could be addressed, but these will be our topics for the most part. But there's one other duality that I think deserves some attention, and that's the duality between humanity as a species or a civilization and our planet Earth. 
So we will spend the next three talks, and actually most of this one, covering the top three dualities on the list. But I want to take them off the table for a moment and look at this last one, because I think it's very important. And it's in the news a lot, not with the word duality attached to it, but there's a continual concern these days about the effect of humanity on the earth. And this has everything to do with how separate humanity feels from the earth and the relationship that exists between the two. One could take an infinite number of photographs of the earth and display them as examples of the wonder of living on this planet. So this is just one that I pulled off the internet. It's in the public domain. I find it quite pleasing. As long as humans have existed as thinking and conceptualizing beings, they've looked at the earth and tried to make sense of it. These days, a lot of how we understand the earth comes from science, which after all has been very successful, both in explaining how nature works and manipulating uh, natural forces and materials. Many people still rely on religious interpretations, even to this day, but prior to the scientific era, religion was the main mode by which people made sense of the earth in conceptual terms. When I began mindful biology, I thought that this apparent duality, so here's another duality between science and spirituality, was a problem and that the goal needed to be to bring the two into alignment, or at least to reconcile them so they could exist side by side harmoniously. I still think that's important, but I no longer think it's the most important issue when it comes to worldview. What seems to me to matter truly is the degree with which we look upon the earth with what might, we might call love or caring or concern. To the extent that either science or the various religious traditions value the earth and care for it in a sustainable way, the future can look relatively promising. To the extent that sense of caring is absent, we face real threat. Now, science is not a single thing. It's a collection of disciplines that have existed for varying lengths of time, from decades to centuries. And it's the work of individuals who have many different viewpoints. But one dominant viewpoint that science takes as a kind of operating position is that the earth is a resource that allows us to extract and then create the things we need. So this is probably not at the heart of most scientific disciplines as practiced in the lab, for instance, but it is at the heart of the whole scientific and technological and corporate and capitalist worldview that we live with, right? And indeed, it's not just capitalism. It has everything to do with how humans are approaching the planet, which is we can draw from the earth petroleum that heats our homes and materials that we can build buildings and cars with. And, you know, this is something that we take for granted. But if the relationship doesn't go any further than that, if the earth is looked at simply as a resource, it does lead to problems such as we're seeing. Now, many religions, certainly not all of them, have something rather similar. They may not look at the earth solely as a resource, although there is language in some traditions that explicitly say that humanity was given the earth by a deity uh, for its own purposes. But even if the emphasis isn't on resource use, there is often in traditions uh, that I'm familiar with a sense in which the experience on the earthly plane is either temporary or base or undesirable. So perhaps there's a better realm like a heaven that we'll get to once we're done here, or perhaps we'll develop our consciousness to the point that we no longer need to come back and live as organisms on earth. Or perhaps it's just an awareness that the 
earth is a painful place and uh, therefore is, you know, there's something wrong with it and we can look to a more abstract principle to, you know, find solace. There are a lot of variations on ways in which the earth is looked at as you know, being separate from humanity and ultimately rather inferior to it. This is clearly not a caring attitude, nor is the attitude of extracting resources to build consumer items caring. In the end, it leads to a sense of separation, like we're just passing by the earth, using it as we go, with a strong sense of we're not part of it. In this type of philosophy, humanity is the primary element. Earth is a distant second. Of course, somewhere uh, out there beyond both humanity and the Earth, there may be another factor, another ground of experience that is even more important than either of these. But clearly, humanity has preference relative to the Earth herself. I think this leads to collective anguish. Some people feel it very consciously and directly. I do. Others, I don't think, are quite as aware of it, but I believe it is a corrosive effect in our culture and that we as a civilization would have a more harmonious existence if we had a different worldview. Well, fortunately, both within science and within many religions, there are healthier and more caring perspectives. I remember a song in camp that went something like, he has the whole world in his hand. The idea being that there is a loving God who cares for the earth and holds it with tenderness. That's a simplistic perspective, but it's a sweet one and it demonstrates caring for the earth. Many Aboriginal traditions likewise have strong feelings of caring. A tradition that I practiced a lot in or worshipped in uh, the Quaker faith has real respect for the earth these days. So too does Catholicism, where I've also spent time with the current Pope. Zen Buddhism and many other Eastern traditions value the earth. So there are obviously examples of religions that view the earth with a loving eye. And there are certainly scientists and even scientific disciplines that focus on developing ways for humanity to support not only human civilization, but the biosphere. So the issue then is much more about how much care is brought to bear on the relationship between humanity and Earth than on how we define the realities around us or how we describe them. If we have a sense of being intimately and sweetly connected to and dependent on the earth, we can live with a kind of duality. I mean, we're not the same as the earth. We're not feeling the essential wholeness to the degree that we might. But there's no real problem in terms of human thriving and the future of human civilization or the thriving of other life forms. This is a much more harmonious situation, a much more pleasing one, in my opinion. And it's based on a spirit of love and care. Not only of loving the planet as a separate being or a separate process, but also understanding that in a certain sense, there is love expressed by the planet toward us in terms of its abundance, the way it provides for us. It's worth contemplating how we can live upon the earth with a sense of loving, mutual, caring support. And I invite you to do so. But we'll move on and return to the primary dualities that we'll be looking at in this series, beginning with mind and body. So we each have a body and we each have a mind, and we're aware that the mind is somehow very closely connected to the brain. And I think we're also aware that the mind has this tendency to separate itself conceptually from the body and look back as if from a kind of distance. This is most obvious when we look in a mirror and we inspect our bodies, but we also do it when we think about how our body is functioning, if we worry about its health, and so on. We're looking at the body as a kind of thing or a separate being at the very least, 
and having a kind of attitude toward it. Now, one effect of this can be feelings of shame and dismay and fear. So I might be ashamed of how I look, uh, particularly uh, as aging changes accumulate, that would be possible. I might be frightened of the vulnerability of my body or uh, made very anxious by some medical condition. If I look at the body and only focus on how it's letting me down, that's going to feel pretty distressing. But it's not automatic, and I could look at the body, even as it ages or even as it suffers health difficulties, with a more loving eye. And this would surely lead to a more contented existence. Turning to the duality between self and others, we bring the same mental apparatus to bear. Certainly, if we can look upon the body as a separate thing, we can look upon others as separate from us. Our tendency to do so will be most pronounced when we feel threatened. And we see a lot of that in the world today, where one group looks upon another as being fundamentally much less worthy, much more evil, and so on. But we don't have to look upon others as being hostile and dangerous and unworthy. We could look upon them with more compassion and generosity. And one way to begin to do so is to remember that everybody grew out of an earlier stage where they were children, where they were innocent and sweet and vulnerable and gentle. People are a product of their upbringing and their surroundings and the worldviews they're exposed to and the hardships that they face. And sometimes that leads to people who are pretty angry and destructive as adults. And surely we need to defend ourselves against destructiveness, but we can do so with a caring attitude. And one thing that can help is, again, remembering the childlike beginning that we all share. And so we can look upon others with a sense of love. And even if we continue to feel fairly separate from them, the world will run a lot more smoothly if we do, and especially if many people do. And what about the duality between the individual self and the earth? Well, if we look upon the earth as something that we use for resources that build the consumer items we use, or even if we just look at it as a kind of playground where we go to nice places and visit, but we don't really care, you know, we might contribute a little money, but we don't feel a sense of genuine human affection for the places we visit or just posting pictures on social media and so on, if we treat the earth as something that we use as opposed to something that we relate with in a caring way, then I think life can feel kind of unsatisfying, rather stark, maybe even boring after a time. But of course, there are other ways to regard the earth. It's well known, I think, that when astronauts get this sort of perspective on the planet, they often have quite powerful experiences. I don't know what this particular astronaut is experiencing looking down upon the planet, but it's not hard uh, watching this scene to imagine that there might be something like awe and wonder and perhaps affection. So holding the earth with an affectionate attitude like we might feel toward a beloved family member or friend or pet would go a long way toward healing some of the problems that we face, if that experience became widespread in particular. So the dualities are not in themselves dangerous to well-being. It's the quality of the relationship that characterizes the duality that matters. If we look upon the earth with caring eyes, or upon our bodies, or upon others with that care, then the planet will do fine, our bodies will feel more like home, and other people will feel more valuable to us. But there is another style of experiencing the earth, the body, and others, and that's to begin to dissolve the very sense of separation that sets up the relationship in the first place. And that's what we'll be focusing on for the rest of this video series.
But today I want to end back at this point of giving attention to the quality of relating within a duality rather than starting out immediately by dissolving it. Because the sense of separation is deepened and sustained very often by feelings of distrust and alienation. If I feel alienated or distrustful from my body, it will be harder for me to feel wholeness within it. If I feel alienated and distrustful from others, I will have a harder time feeling one with them. And if I feel alienated from the earth and don't really trust it in a deep way to sustain my life, I will again have trouble feeling my essential wholeness with it. And it really isn't necessary to go all the way to essential wholeness as a spiritual practice or endeavor. This point was made, I think, quite well by the Indian Saint Ramakrishna. He was familiar with non-dual spiritual traditions. They are common with Indian spirituality and they date back centuries, if not millennia. He knew about them. He was uh, very aware of how they work and why people practice them, but they were not interesting to him because, as he said, I want to taste sugar, not become sugar which is to say he wanted to be in a position where he was separate enough from his experience that he could feel the sweet relationship between himself and this other aspect of reality, whether it was body or earth or other beings, or in his case, uh, a divine presence or ultimate reality, uh, whatever it might be. So we can have a very wholesome and life-sustaining spirituality that is dualistic. And I think in a certain sense, it's helpful to begin there, or at least pay some attention to that side of things as we move toward non-dual realization. And we can certainly meditate and contemplate what these various relationships can feel like when we bring a loving and caring sense ability to them. We can use the power of our attention to sweeten the relationship between self and body, self and other, or self and earth. In this short practice, we will explore the relationship between self and earth. Right now, the body rests upon the earth. So there are points of contact, places where we feel the body settling down onto the earth. Equally, we could experience this as the earth pushing up, lifting up the body, holding it. So feeling the earth holding up the body. The way when we were little, some beloved person's lap held us up, a grandparent, a parent, someone who cared for us. We sat upon or rested upon the lap of this beloved adult as we were held and supported. Imagining that the earth is holding and supporting you right now. That those pressure points are the points of contact between your living body 
in the living, loving earth. There's enough safety that you can relax into the arms of the earth. The earth that provides the air you're breathing, the food you've eaten, the earth that supports you, gave you life. If a person gave us all that the earth gives us, we would know there was love there. Can we feel a quality of caring, one being to another? This human being that is yourself and the planetary being that is the ecosphere. One holding and containing and supporting the other. The body, the body child of the earth, held by the Mother Earth, right now, right here. Just imagine the loving Earth upholding you, providing, nourishing. Each breath internalizes the layer of the earth we call the atmosphere. So you draw the earth in the way an infant might draw milk from the mother in through the mouth into the body. We draw air in through the airways into the body. Nourishment. and the earth below, holding embracing supporting us. Feeling the caring relationship, feeling the sweetness of being a mammal held by the earth. Continue this meditation for as long as you'd like.